our nation's most visionary, most creative developers to discuss with us the urgent issues of homelessness and poverty and affordable housing. Uh, Jim, Rouse, Jim Rouse's career reflects an extraordinary range of interests in public affairs, and that diversity in his interests is reflected, too, in the diversity of groups who have wanted to uh, join in sponsoring this invitation and this, uh, this presentation this afternoon, this evening. The Wiener Center for Social Policy, the Taubman Center for State and Local Government, the Joint Center for Housing Studies, the Institute of Politics, and last but not least, a student group, the Harvard Real Estate and Development, an Urban Development Student Group. Um, you see that a lot of us want in on the uh, action uh, this evening. Jim is a very special person. His, his life work uh, reminds, reminds me of uh, the famous uh, quotation uh, from Robert F. Kennedy, some people see things as they are and ask why. I dream of things that never were and say, why not? When the Boston banks uh, rejected Jim Rouse's uh, visionary ideals for the Faneuil Hall marketplace as uh, doomed to failure, uh, Rouse pressed ahead with, uh, with a vision for Boston's revitalization that uh, inspired a, a range, a series of uh, equally um, landscape-changing developments in American, or American cities. Uh, in its first year, Faneuil Hall outdrew Disneyland. <laughs> this, uh, this same spirit of practical dreaming uh, has also driven Jim Rouse's more recent uh, uh, deep engagement in empowering the urban poor and addressing problems of homelessness and affordable housing. This evening's discussion will be uh, moderated and the panel introduced by Professor Mary Jo Bain of the Wiener Center for Social Policy. Mary Jo. The question that is the topic of tonight's forum is housing the homeless and the poor, how high a priority for the nation? Clearly, that's one of the most urgent questions facing the nation and its government as we move into this next decade. We've seen over the last decade the increasing visibility of homelessness in many of our major cities. Increasing number of people in shelters, increasing numbers of people lining up for the soup kitchens and feeding programs for the poor. Perhaps most distressingly, Many cities have been seeing an increase in homelessness among families, mainly women and children who can't afford or can't find a place to live. And unfortunately, those homeless families are only the tip of the iceberg. They are but a small fraction of a much larger number of poor families who are struggling to live doubled up with other families, crowded into inadequate living facilities, unable to afford good housing. Some of these families become homeless when the final straw drops on the camel's back, when they simply can't make the rent, when they're finally asked to leave by the long-suffering folks with whom they've been living. The homeless are merely a symptom of a larger problem of poverty and housing affordability that affects this nation. And it's this larger problem that Jim Rouse's Enterprise Foundation is dealing with and that our three panelists will speak to this evening. Mr. Rouse was born in Maryland, graduated from the University of Maryland Knight Law School. In 1939, he founded the company, which is now the Rouse Company, to which he devoted his time and energy um, between his return from naval service during World War II until about 1984. We Bostonians, as Bob Putnam have pointed out, enjoy the benefits of the Rouse Company's uh, enterprise in the Fanel Hall marketplace. The citizens of other cities, we will also admit, uh, have uh, uh, not equally good, but not bad uh, results of his development as well. Uh, since 1984, Mr. Rouse has been the chairman and chief executive officer of the Enterprise Development Corporation and the Enterprise Foundation. The mission of the foundation is to provide fit, decent, and affordable housing within a generation and the opportunity for people to help themselves towards self-sufficiency. It's the combination of these two missions 
the mission to provide affordable housing and the mission to help the poor and the homeless move towards self-sufficiency that's so special about the Enterprise Foundation. I was talking before the panel uh, about some of the examples of projects that the Enterprise Foundation has funded, which I know Mr. Rouse will talk about. But there are just example after example in many cities of places which have not only provided housing managed by tenants under the control of the community, but the associated services to help people more towards self-sufficiency. These locally based comprehensive programs are really the foundation of Mr. Rouse's efforts uh, and we're really eager to hear about those. After Mr. Rouse speaks, we will have two respondents uh, from two of the other organizations sponsoring this event. Uh, the first will be William Apgar, who is Associate Professor of City and Regional Planning here at the Kennedy School, and who is the Associate Director of the Joint Center for Housing Studies. Following him in responding will be Harry Spence, who is a lecturer of the Kennedy School of Government, associated with the Taubman Center for State and Local Government, and a former receiver of the Boston Housing Authority. So the format tonight will be that Mr. Rouse will speak, then Bill and Harry will respond, uh, at that point, we will open up for questions and responses from the floor, and I will make everybody go home about 7.30. Thank you very much. Mary Jane's <clears throat> an old friend who I haven't seen for a long time. Um, I, I used to be a part of the Harvard-MIT Joint Center for Urban Studies, which she was a very important person, too. And uh, Bill Apgar was a, was a whole pile of wisdom to the National Housing Task Force, which I had the happiness to chair over in 1987-88. Uh, <coughs> I, I have a couple of troops with me who I, uh, my, uh, co-founder and co-worker in the Enterprise Foundation is my wife, Patty Rouse, who's right there. And I brought along my secret Harvard helper in uh, Bart Harvey, who's a Harvard graduate, a Harvard MBA graduate, a Wall Street graduate to the happier life of working for the poor. <laughs> Being, being at Harvard uh, with your bright students and strong faculty is, uh, is a very valuable experience for me, and I mean that because I've had that opportunity several times. And uh, when asked, I was very happy to come because uh, I've always come away uh, richer from that experience than the Harvard students have. I expect your questions and comments to spark my thinking and freshen my case, my advocacy. I have to be a salesman every day I live in this business. <clears throat> and I need that freshening. I'm not here to give a passive exposition on the homeless and the poor, but to stir your outrage at how life is at the bottom of our society and, to, and the danger it is to our country at the present time, and to make you aware that these conditions can be transformed and must be transformed. There's a, a lot of misinformation about the homeless. Uh, those who care deeply sometimes overrate the circumstance and thereby almost discredit it because uh, when you begin to state homeless in millions of numbers, why people will quickly show it's not so and therefore what else are you saying that's not so? Uh, and the problems can be uh, uh, exaggerated and the purity and cleanliness and innocence of the homeless can be exaggerated. Um, sometimes the solutions are oversimplified. And on the other hand, those who want not to be disturbed uh, find it uh, very comforting to minimize the problem as almost not existing. It, uh, it can be grossly understated, both in the problem of it and the numbers of it. As one of our most uh, prominent American leaders said a couple of years ago, that uh, nobody is on the street who doesn't choose to be there. Uh, this was a horrible and outrageous statement for a prominent American to make. Congress asked the National Academy of Sciences uh, 
two years ago, a little less than two years ago, to study and report on the homeless, to tell them what the, what the real story was, and they did that in the last session of Congress. And the report was detached in style, as Academy of Sciences reports are, and objective in its substance so detached and so objective that in a very rare circumstance there was a dissent from the report by 11 members of the committee. And the dissent wasn't based on the substance, but it was based on the spirit of the report. It was, it was uh, slashed at the indifference of the report. They wanted the committee to say that this was a national disgrace, a scandal, that these conditions existed. Um, it was a very strong not substance dissent, but spirit dissent from the report. The report estimated that there are 750,000 homeless people in America and that there are 100,000 children on the street every night. Uh, they also estimated that there are 6 million people behind those people who live at extreme risk because they cannot afford the housing they're living in. But think of Think of just that figure of 100,000 children, of, of 100,000 children tonight, tomorrow night, the next night, living on the, on the streets of this country. Mothers and children walking streets and roads, looking for a place to sleep like stray animals. This is our country. This is the United States in which these conditions are true. I don't think we've ever faced conditions like this, certainly not in my lifetime. Uh, I don't even think in the Depression, which was a part of my lifetime. We had, uh, there were instances of this. There were aggregations of, of very poor people. But to have this as a, as a part of our life system today, I get distressed when I see articles from time to time. There was one not long ago in the New York Times by a meeting of educators on how they could set up a proper educational system for the poor, a system for poor children on the streets in this country, which implies a kind of acceptance of this as being something we, we must accommodate. It's, uh, uh, there's, there's, this, this leads to indifference. This leads to the major problem we face in this country today, which is a real indifference to the condition in which people are living. And the conditions are getting worse, not better. Uh, we don't have many figures, I know of no objective figures on the increase in, in uh, the homeless, but people living with it uh, say it increases. The only single report I saw was from the United Way of Cincinnati, which estimated a 26 percent annual increase in homeless in Cincinnati. There also was a report at a meeting I attended in New York in which it was said that 100,000 homeless people find permanent housing each month. Uh, others they couldn't account for, but 200,000 people are added to the homeless each month. The, uh, uh, why is this so? What, what's the cause of this? This is the question that gets asked me a lot when I'm talking to people, and it's very important because it's absolutely essential to understanding the homeless. In a 10-year period from 1925 to 32, the number of people in poverty in the United States increased from 25 million to 32 million. And in roughly that same decade, not exactly matching, but middle, middle 70s to middle 80s, the number of units running for $250 a month declined by over 2.5 million. So here was poverty going up and available low rent housing going down. And as that gap widened, people can't pay the rent. There are uh, there are 13 million, census reported, 13 million people with incomes of $10,000 a year or less. And nearly one half of those people pay over 50% of their income in rent. When it gets down to 7,000 a year, over 70% pay 50% of their income in rent. But 10,000 a year, this is, this is the earnings of a, of a household, a man or woman, making $5 an hour, 40 hours a week, 50 weeks a year makes $10,000. And if they're paying 50% or more of that in rent, there's $15 a day left for everything else, for food, clothing, transportation, everything else in life, $15 a day. That's the, that's where the, where the pressure is that puts people on the street. I was at a meeting in New York 
a few months ago in which a, a fine, wealthy developer with, who is doing things about the homeless made the statement that with $75 million, I can clear the homeless from New York City. But he couldn't. He thought it's a pool. It isn't a pool. It's a surging stream of people moving in all the time, all over the country. It's not a pool. It can't be seen as a pool. It can't be corrected as a pool. It can only be corrected by going to its source. We've got to correct the conditions that we, which people are living in miserable houses, in miserable neighborhoods, and paying more rent than they can afford. Just a, a kind of a co corroborating or illustrating figure, 25% of the jobs in the United States pay less than $15,000 a year. That's a quarter of the country. It, um, um, we, uh, every, every now and then, we all see these reports, we've been seeing them for years, that the uh, income of the highest 20% increases and the income of the lowest 20% decreases. And that's been steadily happening with a larger and larger gap between the rich and the poor. Many homeless are addicted, alcoholic, mentally impaired. But because there are many, a lot of people say that's the homeless. And that's not the homeless. Don't know this figure, never seen it accurately attempted. But somewhere between a third to a half of the people are not uh, drug addicted, alcoholic, or mentally impaired. They're working people, uh, many of them full time, a lot of them part time. It's, uh, and, the, and the increase in the homeless now is coming largely from families, from uh, woman and child or, or man, woman and child. Uh, Washington Post had a, a lead a front page on the Metropolitan section uh, last year. It was a picture of a woman, a young woman holding a baby in one arm and a, a two-year-old child by her hand. And uh, the, under the picture it said that uh, this woman makes $13,000 a year working at a nurse's aid and has been living in a shelter for three months because there was no place to live. The, uh, the Post uh, sent people out to inquire about that shelter, found that 71% in the shelter were, living, were working part-time, 49% were working full-time and living in a shelter in Northern Virginia. Uh, many of the, of, the, of the people clustered at the heart of our center of our cities today are, are jobless, uh, 40 to 50 to 60 percent are the pools of jobless at the center of that city. I've uh, heard it said, read it said, that 48 percent of all young black men in America today are jobless. 48 percent. What message does that communicate to a young black guy in high school as to whether it's worthwhile finishing or not? And. Uh, and, and a whole lot of black and white young guys don't finish. Typically in our, cent in our center city schools today, 40% or more of the high school students don't finish. Think of that, what that means to our future. These masses of people, jobless, homeless, idleness, vulnerable to alcohol, drugs, crime, a sub-life of violence and fear, these are the jungles in the American city, and small cities, and towns even. Jungles of people, alienated, disaffected, no stake in American values or culture, threaten our stability and our, and our civilization. What does it cost us? Loss of workers, people without education, training, skills, unable to perform, threatening our competitive capacity as a nation. Uh, last week, I was in Los Angeles with uh, Bart and Patty, heard uh, Lee Iacocca give a talk in which, uh, to a relatively small group of people, and he was saying, we've just built a $2 billion plant in Detroit, and there are five neighborhoods surrounding our, our plant. The, the rate of dropout is now over 55 percent. The, the literacy coming to our plant to work is just unmanageable. And now we've had to print instructions on our equipment in international sign language because so many people can't read them. The United States, competitive industry we're thinking about. The cost of paying these conditions through the subsidies of support 
of those who can't make it in all of these subculture ways. Hundreds of billions of dollars. Uh, far more than it would cost us to correct them, I believe. The cost of security to our houses, cars, offices, factories, public place to protect, to protect us all against these conditions. The cost of maintaining ever-expanding cars, offices, factories, places to the, uh, the I heard the assistant superintendent of schools for California say that uh, uh, the reason we're putting so many people uh, in jail is, uh, is because we don't have any other place for them. It's uh, the cost of a disaffected, alienated population that lives without this stake or future in America. It's, uh, it's tinder for radical torches. Leon Sullivan, a great, great black man from Philadelphia, a fine minister who is responsible for the Sullivan principles that have helped to guide our State Department in dealing with South Africa, who set up remarkable work programs for young blacks, training them in the industry. He gave a talk out in Germantown a few months ago in which he said to the people of Germantown, if the suburbs don't come into the city, meaning if the rich don't come to the poor, the riots of 68 will seem like a picnic within three years. This, is, this is, has got to be on our screen these days. A, a, a dwelling a family can afford is, is not the answer to all these problems. doesn't give the answer to drugs, to education, to health. Um, but it's a fundamental platform for self-respect, dignity, hope, openness to change and growth, to education and training, to a good life as an alternative to an abandoned one. You just simply can't get started to educate and train people on the street. And you can't do much better with people that are living under circumstances where one setback and they're on the street. Millions of people today are living in fear tonight of a bill they couldn't pay last week, of rent they couldn't pay, and headed for the street tomorrow. This is an American condition and a growing one. Index of our future, 40% dropout from high schools, 25% of the babies born in inner city hospitals in America are addicted at birth. How do you like this for the future of our country? How seriously can we take this? There was a recent New York Times article that that quoted three great Americans. Uh, it was after a session on, also on education, in which, but looking at the conditions in this country, David Kearns, the chairman of Xerox, said, and the New York Times quote was, a devastating condition. Uh, Brad Butler, former chairman of Procter & Gamble, former head of the National Chamber of Commerce, said we are developing a third world civilization in our country. And Jim Burke, the uh, former chairman of Johnson & Johnson, said, the American dream has turned into the American nightmare. This is where we are. The, uh, we're the wealthiest country in the world with one of the highest problem-solving capabilities in the world. And yet we stand wringing our hands or just turning in indifference to these conditions in this country. The, these conditions don't exist in other free, democratic, industrialized nations. Doesn't exist in Western Europe. Doesn't exist in the United Kingdom. Doesn't exist in Japan. They don't know what these conditions are. I testified before the Budget Committee of the House last week, a uh, week before last, <coughs> and the chairman, it was the day after President Havel of Czechoslovakia had addressed Congress, and the chairman of the committee opened the meeting by commenting on this uh, marvelous uh, uh, talk of uh, President Havel. And I was then called upon to testify, and I began by saying that I, I was impressed with those remarks, and I wonder if we would have dared take President Havel to Pennsylvania Station in New York at 7 o'clock in the morning. If you haven't had that experience, don't miss it. To walk through Pennsylvania Station and see every chair, every bench, every inch of the floor stretched out with thousands of people only place they can spend the night. And then you go up the escalator and you start through the stores out to 7th Avenue, 
All the walls, all the store entrances, just solid with homeless people. We, uh, uh, in, in, that, uh, in a meeting I was in New York, the, uh, one of the speakers was the director of, uh, of uh, the Port Authority, and he was saying that how they now are having to set up separate shelters in order to take care of the people who want to sleep in, the, in all the ports of entry into New York, railroad, boat, airplane, whatever they are, because the, the homeless have become so numerous that they impede the operation of the, of the port of entry. Incidentally, a, a nasty little story is that uh, they were having trouble in Wall Street with, uh, with uh, this condition. There was great opposition to their building a shelter. And uh, a very prominent New York law firm <coughs> offered pro bono help to the people who were fighting the shelter. Um, But there's also another side of this story, and that other side is hope. There's a remarkable springing up around this country of, of concern and action on that concern, of, uh, of new initiatives, new programs, uh, dealing with the pieces of these conditions. Uh, everywhere you turn, and you, if you get past the murders that are on the front page of the papers, there's one after another story, week after week, of some new initiative, some people doing something about schools, doing something about housing, doing something about food, doing something that, is, that springs hope. It, uh, it's in all the, all the fields which together make up this uh, dilemma in our cities. Uh, there are very important lessons being learned. There are very important demonstrations being made of, of the way to solutions. When we had our National Housing Task Force study, this was a, a, a task force that was appointed by um, Senators D'Amato and Cranston that uh, David Maxwell and I headed. And uh, we pointed the task force ourselves. Uh, there was no political influence or intervention at all. We raised the money ourselves, so it was a completely independent task force. And we met. Uh, every week for two days and a night from early October until mid-December. It, uh, it was intense and, uh, and it was valuable. Uh, this was everybody from left and right in the housing picture, people who never agree on housing, never have come together before Congress with a proposal. And I said at the beginning of the task force that I don't expect uh, uh, a unanimous report because we never agree. But it was a unanimous report. And it was a unanimous report because everybody there saw that this problem was so deep and so trying for our country that we had to come up with a report, a common proposal. And we did. And we, it was uh, made into uh, act now before Congress in the affordable housing bill. But that National Housing Task Force report, its major, its major representation was, was to deal with what it called the new wave in America. And that new wave was all these local initiatives happening all over the country. That uh, this represented the hope, this represented the potential for a new way of getting at the problem, of money going from, from Congress, not to big programs laid down on cities, but going to the cities so they could support new initiatives, local programs that met local needs. And we hope that's gonna happen. The, uh, the other, new hope of these days is the attitude of the administration. It's very different. Uh, the, their budget didn't show much difference. The budget was discouraging. But it's very different to have an administration that recognizes the problems and shows concern. And there's a great difference in Jack Kemp as Secretary of HUD. He genuinely cares. He's learning the problems. He's determined to do something about it. He's, he's full of compassion and full of passion about the poor. Uh, he, he's the, he's the, the finest Secretary of HUD that I have known. And we are this far apart, and normally, in political, economic, uh, social beliefs. But he wants to do something. And there's a big difference in an administration that sees the problems and wants to do something. At least they're starting out differently on the problem. And there's going to be more money come out of Congress, I bet, than the administration has asked for. I think maybe they want the Democrats to provide the money so that the, the big spenders can do it. Uh, there's also new hope in corporate leaders. 
There's a very different attitude in the heads of American corporations today. They're concerned. They're worried. They generally are worried about what's happening to our country. They're worried about workers not being competitive. They're worried about the dangers they see in, in this huge mass of alienated people in our country. Uh, in, in Los Angeles last week, we, uh, we met with uh, one man with over a billion dollars who, who, was, who was caring so much that he was ready to put up a lot of money, ready to buy tax credits, ready to give money. The president of a very big corporation who's ready to join with him. It wasn't true five years ago, three years ago. Um, the other day, after I gave a talk to the Chamber of Commerce in, uh, in Baltimore, I was asked to stay at the rostrum, and a representative of IBM came up and gave us $750,000. They had given us money before, but this was a, a new check, new gift. We've raised, uh, there are four individuals in the New York area who, give, who each have given us a million dollars to house the poor. That kind of thing didn't happen a little while ago. This um, uh, churches and temples, we were out in, in Skid Row in Los Angeles, and uh, an incredible place. I don't, there are 11,000 people living on Skid Row in 65 slop house hotels, and now they want to tear them down and build office buildings. But there's a, a woman priest who is this big and this tough, and she's already acquired 15 of these hotels, and she's going to acquire them all. It's going to take $300 million, and she's going to raise it. And I don't have a doubt in my mind that she will. And we saw what she had done with two of these hotels, making them in a wonderful place for these people at the very bottom of society to live. And the churches and temples are coming in and taking over these hotels one by one to provide volunteer help, to help with furniture, to see that the life is decent. We... Uh, the Enterprise Foundation started back in 1972 when I was asked to go see a little church and talk about housing the poor. And uh, I, I went and told them there was nothing they could do, and happily they went on and did something anyway and came back and had two dreadful buildings that uh, I agreed to help them finance. And uh, three years later, with 50,000 hours of volunteer help, these buildings were fit and affordable and decent places to live. It's, uh, um, they then went on. They, did, they, they, they knew the condition of the poor. They, uh, they saw uh, their need for jobs, their need for health care, their need for, for uh, transitional housing. And one by one, they've stepped up to these needs. Uh, Patty and I have served on the board since the beginning of Jubilee Housing, it was called. And in, uh, in uh, 82, we started the Enterprise Foundation, born out of that. Uh, they, we started the foundation to work from the bottom up in, in neighborhoods around the country to help them have the strength and the resources to, to house the poor. We're now in 30 nonprofit groups in 32 cities across the country, and uh, <clears throat> we provide technical assistance in how to do things at low cost, how to raise money at low cost, uh, how to supply, how to get jobs for people. We're in, in uh, 18 job placement centers in 14 cities have put 16,000 people off the street in jobs. But uh, important as it was, we, we came to realize it was not enough, not nearly enough, that, uh, that the whole, everything that's happening in this country wasn't even keeping up with the pace of deterioration. And that, therefore, what are we going to do? Are we going to stand there before a tide that's just washing over us every day? Uh, what do we do? What do you do? Any of us do. And we decided we had to recklessly abandon the disciplines that we had lived by. We didn't go anywhere where we didn't have the money and didn't have the troops. And we decided that beginning in January, we would answer the call of any city in the country that called upon us. We estimated that it would be a city a week over the next five years, 230 cities. We've done 30 in six years, um, eight years. And also that we had to do much more about connecting the human service capacity of a city with the housing. So we have set up a unit in the foundation to link the human service capability of city government, state government, United Way, churches, whatever, with the housing so that, the, that they're working on the lives of people as well as the condition of the buildings. We also decided that in, 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 in a neighborhood in each of three cities, 
we would undertake to make a demonstration of all the housing being made fit and affordable, city doing all the work it ought to do on the neighborhood, and then to focus on that neighborhood, the full human service support of the city, city, state, private agencies, to see how high it would be possible to lift a neighborhood of 10 to 20,000 people. How high could you lift it? What couldn't you do? What would it cost and what would it save? Haven't done this in America. We haven't tried to find out what the answers might be. We've got to do it. We've got to find out. There's uh, an enormous job ahead of us in this country. It's, uh, and I, I hope that I, that I leave you uh, pained by the life of millions of people and who are struggling to survive in this jungle of, of uh, crime, violence, neglect, uh, feeling abandoned in a prosperous society, and that you'll feel outraged uh, uh, about these conditions and feel excited about uh, uh, what you can do and worried about your own future in this society if we don't correct these conditions. And I, I hope you will know that thousands of people, thousands of people in this country, big and little, rich and poor, are, are waking up to these conditions and working at them. There's more stuff being tried today in America than we ever dreamed of when we started. But it still isn't very much. We can't be misled to think that because a lot's being attempted, a lot is happening. It isn't yet. But there's, it can be done. These problems can be solved. This nation can be transformed at the bottom. And I swear, I believe to the bottom of the soles of my shoes that this society cannot survive with the persistence of these conditions at the, at the bottom uh, that we face. It's, uh, it's our job, old men like me, young people like you, uh, we have the challenge, the inspiring destiny of taking hold of these hopes and making them reality to transform America. That can be the 90s for all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Jim Morales has reminded us that the nation faces a complex set of problems relating to housing, poverty, and homeless. He's also reminded us that there's a lot of activism and action bubbling up from the bottom in neighborhoods around the country. Yet despite this activity and despite the effort of the Enterprise Foundation and others to focus attention on critical issues of housing and poverty, I believe it's a sign of the times that the title of Jim's talk is a question, not a statement. The question, how high a priority for the nation is housing, homelessness, and the poor? Rouse offers considerable hope that the answer to this question is yes. Yes, housing, poverty, and homelessness can and indeed must be high priority issues. At the same time, we are all aware that there are serious obstacles to overcome before this hopeful view becomes a reality. First. It seems clear to me that efforts to advance national housing legislation continue to be slowed by the lack of confidence among many voters in the basic ability of government to address critical domestic problems. The irony here, or rather the tragedy, is that the same Reagan administration that pushed so hard to limit the role of government in housing and other areas, at the same time, by its own mismanagement of our national housing programs, did so much to under, undermine the very confidence in the ability of public agencies to serve the interest of those in need of assistance. Equally important is the fact that the current patchwork of housing assistance programs contains numerous inequities, inconsistencies, and gaps. Current program guidelines define many households as in need of assistance, but serve only a fraction of those eligible. One poor family may be lucky enough to get a Section 8 certificate and have decent and affordable housing. While at the same time, the vast majority of the poor must devote 50% of their income or more to secure at best marginally adequate housing. The result is that even the advocates for housing argue among themselves as to how best to target limited housing resources. Finally, housing policy discussions carry with them all the divisiveness associated with the nation's inability 
to move beyond the prejudicial attitudes relating to race, ethnicity, class, and gender. The sad truth is that in many circles, housing is not discussed as a national issue, but rather is discussed as a black issue or an inner city issue or an issue that relates to the female-headed households. In light of these significant obstacles, little wonder that housing policy issues barely register on a national political agenda. Without minimizing the scope of the task ahead, there is reason for some hope. And I think our speaker here tonight, Jim Rouse, symbolizes much that is hopeful about the current state of our nation's housing. For those of you who are inspired by Rouse's speech would do well to review the work of the National Housing Policy Task Force that he spoke of, and it was ably chaired by him and Jim Rouse. In my opinion, their report, uh, uh, David Maxwell and Jim Rouse, right? Okay. Don't want to get Mr. Fannie Mae wrong here. In my opinion, their report, uh, entitled A Decent Place to Live, provides a framework upon which to build a revitalized national housing policy. The report begins by arguing that the first priority in any housing policy discussion must be to reassert federal leadership in the housing area. This makes sense. The number of households in need of assistance vastly exceeds currently available housing assistance resources. The states, the localities, and newly emerging community-based organizations have major roles to play in providing affordable housing. But without commitment and funding at the federal level, any renewed national housing initiative is sure to fail. The report presents many specific suggestions as to how to best structure housing assistance effort, and in doing so, so advocates for expanded federal funding for a series of flexible housing assistance efforts that can build on the many innovative housing initiatives now underway at the state and local level. Some doubt the potential for what the Rouse Maxwell Report label as the new wave of housing assistance efforts. But I suggest that the doubters take a hard look at the considerable accomplishments of the Enterprise Foundation and their affiliated organizations. Through their efforts to empower and expand the capacity of neighborhood-based organizations, through their efforts to forge productive alliances among state and local governments, among private businesses, nonprofit organizations, and the like, Jim Rouse and Enterprise are demonstrating in cities and towns across the country the yes, indeed, the nation can effectively address the problems of housing, poverty, and homeless. Enterprise provides a model of what can be done to accomplish the task on a wider scale, but to accomplish the task on a wider scale, we must work to elevate the issues of housing and poverty to the rightful place on the national political agenda. We must also continue to work to develop programs and institutions that can restore in the population at large a greater sense of trust in the ability of government at all levels of government to address critical domestic policy issues. This, I believe, is Jim Rouse's vision. It's a hopeful vision, and I believe it's a vision that many share in this room today. We are honored to have him with us. Thank you. Jim Rouse tonight, um, it seems to me, uh, rang an alarm bell in the night for us, uh, one that we have heard in some measure before but seem uh, not to have heard clearly enough. Um, that alarm bell started with pointing out the causes of the terrible distresses of homelessness. Um, I'd just like to point out that, in fact, I think that data uh, comes from Bill Apgar's State of the Nation's Housing Report, um, evidence, in fact, of, uh, of the contribution of the Joint Center and of research more, more fundamentally, I think, in helping us understand and understand truly the nature of uh, the problems uh, that we face so that we can move meaningfully and effectively to respond to them. Then moving from the data on the causes of homelessness to a description of the danger to our society that this disorder represents, its threat to our stability and our civilization. And as Jim points out, we tend to look at the poor and to analyze their, quotes, pathology um, in order to try and understand the nature of that threat. And in the process of trying to understand that, quotes, pathology, we tend enormously to oversimplify. What is occurring among the poor is immensely complex, painful, uh, morally uh, uh, 
complicated internally, although in some sense simply, simple in what it requires of, it, of us. I thought I might spend a few minutes in response to Jim's remarks talking about a different pathology, not the pathology of the poor, but the pathology of the affluent, which is the other aspect of the problem of homelessness and, and distress of housing. What is it that is so pathological about us that we allow this condition to occur for our fellow citizens? What is the nature of that pathology, which Jim is trying to speak to and trying in some measure to, if not cure, at least diagnose? How is it that the empowered allow such human waste, pain, and misery to continue unabated? It seems to me that that question about whether or not the response of the empowered to these circumstances, um, that question whether or not that response is pathological, whether it's pathological or healthy, whether, it's, whether it is productive, humanly productive or destructive, is being argued out in lots of fora, but it's being argued out, among other places, in the community development movement. That movement that seeks to respond to this distress in impoverished, poor, uh, in impoverished urban communities, frequently communities of color, by seeking to restore decency and safety to conditions of life in those communities. It's being argued out in the community development movement, I think, because, uh, in fact, there is a certain ambiguity in the meaning of the community development movement, an ambiguity where I think Jim Rouse clearly speaks uh, for the hopeful and productive and humanly uh, committed aspect, not the pathological aspect of that movement. The ambiguity in the community development movement, it seems to me, rests in the question, is it a movement for empowerment? or is it a movement for recolonization? Jim Rouse has pushed consistently that it be a movement not for recolonization but for empowerment in the halls of the powerful. The difference between those two approaches, it seems to me, is the question of whether the community development movement seeks to restore order in poor communities, it seeks, of course, to do that because disorder is always a threat to privilege always a threat to privilege. Therefore, the restoration of order is important to privilege. But privilege can choose either of two courses in response to disorder. It can choose either that response of ceding power so that those who have been disempowered can shape orders that are their own and orders that arise out of the needs of and the dynamic of life in poor communities. That is a response of empowerment. Or the community development movement can seek to restore order and protect the, the privileges of the powerful by using its immense dollar resources, which in some measure seem small relative to the task, but huge relative to the poverty of the neighborhoods and communities they seek to serve, by holding out those resources in order to engage a compliant leadership in the task of reclaiming for the privileged and for the powerful territory that has escaped its grasp. That question, it seems to me, is the central battle within the community development movement today. Which of these two strategies is in fact going on? And the answer, I think, remains ambiguous, which is why Jim Rouse's statements continue to be crucially important. I'd propose that we look at three indicators to see whether in the coming years what direction the community development movement is moving. I also think, in fact, where the community development movement moves will tell us much is a kind of crucial barometer about the directions in which the, the empowered more fundamentally in the society will choose to respond to this problem of disorder. So it's not only a, an indicator of the future of the community development movement, more profoundly it's an indicator of the response of the powerful to the disorder that's occurring. Three indicators I'd propose we look at. One would be, does the community development movement focus on the development of institutional capacity in poor communities 
in ways that include, most crucially, the recognition of the importance of building broad community capacity and broad community support um, and broad community engagement and involvement in the activities of community development and that encourage not just technical activity but political activity by the poor? Or does it instead seek to create in every local neighborhood a small, isolated, nonprofit production company increasingly estranged from the roots in which it is founded? Secondly, what is the racial characteristic of the intermediary organizations which are the fora for negotiation about the allocation of power in the community development movement between the downtown political and financial institutions and the neighborhood organizations? What is the composition of those intermediary organizations? Do we see real negotiation about power going on there? Or are they primarily representatives of downtown and overwhelmingly white institutions with token representation of communities of color and, and neighborhoods um, and impoverished neighborhoods? And thirdly, are we going to see some simplification of the absurdly complex financial systems by which this housing must be financed, complexities which belittle the complexity of uh, the $700 million fan peer project that I worked on. I look at community development corporations trying to build $500,000 housing, unit, housing uh, uh, developments of a few units, having to deal with a level of financial complexity and legal complexity that's greater than the IPO encountered in a $700 million development. Are we going to move to simplify those systems so that they are not impediments to empowerment, so that they're not means to ensure that, in fact, in the end, community organizations are only the handmaidens of lawyers, financial wizards, and other downtown forces? Or are we going to simplify that system so that it is, in fact, accessible and controllable by neighborhoods, by voluntary organizations, by people whose lives are not shaped by flying to Los Angeles and back in a day, but instead have to do with walking down to the neighborhood grocery. Those three, it seemed to me, useful indicators of which way the community development movement is going. Um, there are undoubtedly more, and there may be more powerful ones than those, but they're the ones that come to mind. Um, and I am certainly uh, pleased that Jim continues to voice in the halls of the powerful the uh, the need and the term empowerment again and again and again. Thank you. We now have time for questions. There is a microphone on each side down here and I believe also a microphone uh, upstairs on each side and I will play traffic cop First, however, uh, since uh, I am here, uh, I want to answer, ask a question of, of uh, Mr. Rouse and of uh, Bill and Harry if they would, if they would like to uh, answer it also. The reform of 30 or 40 or 50 years ago in the housing area was the construction of public housing projects. Uh, slums were cleared and housing was built for the poor, which was designed to be better housing than they had had before and to provide the kind of environments for families which would enable them to move out of poverty. Looking back on most of those experiments now, they don't seem to have been a success. They don't seem to have been a success because many of our housing projects now are the places which hold the greatest concentration of desperation, crime, lack of jobs, the potential pool for the homeless. I'm just wondering, Jim, if you would speak to how the projects that you're working with or the projects that you're watching develop deal with those same issues? Are there ways to keep housing for the poor from becoming the extremely poor housing that public housing seems to be? 
Well, it's largely become that. I think uh, irretrievably that. The people who are not poor and who are left in public housing are kind of just stagnated there. And the movement in public housing of people coming in, moving up and out, seems to have almost stopped. Um, but the conditions within even the good public housing, and there's a lot of good public housing in the country, public housing has taken a, a, a terrible smashing criticism for what are the perfectly dreadful conditions in some of it that really are just insufferable. Uh, the famous stories on the public housing in Chicago where kids going to school are shot out across the courtyards and dodging bullets and uh, it, it's a, a woman in a, one of the public housing units uh, couldn't, her door wouldn't work, uh, door was torn off and she uh, complained to the management and they said we don't, we don't have a door, just move your ice box and put it in front of the door. Uh, that's the only door we have and she had to move it back and forth when her children went in and out. In incredible conditions for a civilized society but we now have one public housing authority that is very good. If you drove through this city and looked at the public housing, you would mistake it for just a private garden apartments. It's well done, well managed, well maintained. But they say that within this, this housing are all the conditions we're talking about in the country. And uh, what we're talking with them about is doing the, answering the question you're raising, is combining that those, lar those quite large public housing projects with an equal amount of private bad and not so bad housing as a neighborhood and see what can be done to lift the lives of the people in the public housing as we've been talking about just in slum neighborhoods. Um, they want to do it. The city wants to do it. Want to work at it. Work at the lives of the people. Figure how we can overcome these uh, terribly negative conditions. And uh, we would like to do it. Uh, it, it. It needs to be done. We need to get at the, at the, to really seriously ask the questions of what makes this life so bad and how can it be corrected. And uh, not assume that we're going to get simple answers to that. Assume that it's very complex answers. But then work at it. And public housing needs to be a focus of that as well as private housing. Do you want to speak to that here? Um, sure. I Um, yes. There we go. It, it seems to me that, that crucial to this actually is the work that Jim and so many others are doing, which is to try and break the, uh, the provision of, of uh, housing for the poor out of um, the constrictive bureaucratic and regulatory structures that it seems to me treat uh, housing um, as a commodity rather than as community. Um, it, it, I think fundamental to the problems of public housing is the is our analogy of in, in our regulatory system that a housing unit is the same as a welfare grant um, and therefore has to be distributed and assigned to bring out from under that uh, um, just uh, throttling uh, that uh, um, uh, regulatory structure the provision of housing for the poor um, and I think that's the hope um, obviously that's still again very much in balance because uh, we tend in our uh, our uh, rational and logical nature to feel that uh, perhaps we ought then to extend this regime, this insane regime, to, uh, to neighborhood groups as well. And if that occurs, I think the answer is we'll have the same problems in nonprofit housing we have in public housing. Would you please introduce yourself and also indicate who you would like to have respond to your question? I'm uh, Bob Kehoe and Mr. Rouse. Um, my question was that my understanding is that HUD a couple years ago tried as a pilot program, uh, the housing voucher idea. And uh, it met with, as I understand it, mixed results. Do you think that any form of that, of a housing voucher system, could work to help with the housing problems? Yes, I think as a residual assistance uh, at the bottom end under circumstances where there are no other solutions, I think there should always be a quantity of, of uh, housing vouchers. I lean a little lower on where I would put it than others. In our housing task force report, we proposed that the 100,000 vouchers that were provided in the Reagan budget, that there be another 100,000 added. 
but the reason, but there are advocates in the administration that the only answer is vouchers, that uh, there should be no other assistance to housing than vouchers. And uh, they would argue that it's cheaper, which I don't believe. Uh, it's certainly simpler. What you do is simply give the people the money to, to rent a, a market rent apartment. But uh, there are a lot of things very bad about that. One is it does nothing about the conditions of the city, that uh, this just writes off all this bad housing and let it, lets it rot away. Uh, whereas a lot of, in many cities, a lot of housing by being effectively rehabilitated, rehabilitated is the cheapest housing it can get. And most little, it's in old neighborhoods, and it's old housing, and it, it's, uh, it's, better, it's better material for recreating a neighborhood life than a project uh, of any kind. So I, I think that it has a place, but I think it, it's an overstated case by much of this new administration. Bill, you're the resident economist here tonight. To, you're required to respond to this question about housing vouchers. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, a lot of economists have endorsed the housing uh, voucher idea uh, because I don't think they've really thought through the serious issues that confront the poor in the inner city. Uh, vouchers don't create the kind of institutional capacity, community-based organizations that we meet, need in order to relate the housing issues to this wider set of uh, social policy issues. And so, well, in some instances, vouchers can help. In a lot of instances, you need to work in the broader context of housing development programs, community development programs, and like to build a type of institutional capacity to address the root causes. And so I share with uh, Jim Rouse's view that there are some situations where vouchers help, <coughs> but we need a lot more than that if we're going to address these problems. It's also kind of a fraud because uh, we're never going to provide all the housing that's needed by vouchers because it's going to be an ever-expanding need. when when uh, the answer to housing is an entitlement, like uh, food stamps or, or welfare, social security, why, then there's no need for anybody, for all the forces, the little and big, that operate in the company to try to do something about housing. They all quit, including the people. You don't, uh, a church group doesn't go out to work at housing. Um, community development corporations don't work about housing. It's all futile. It's been accounted for but it will never be accounted for in the dollars that it takes to do it. So it will tend to push aside the other processes that are harder, tougher, cheaper, uh, and cause everybody to be relying on vouchers that aren't there. But Jim, won't the response of enterprising, pardon the expression, companies <laughs> like your own, i.e. the profit-making side uh, of, your, of your enterprise, uh, won't you respond to the fact that there are more people, if, if there are more vouchers out there, that there will be more people out there able to pay rents and you guys will get into the market? Well, uh, there's been a great difference between vouchers, which were given to the public, and Section 8 vouchers, which attached to housing. Section 8 voucher attached to housing, which was available to a developer so that his the, the tenants for that building were pretty well assured, but housing, but vouchers splashed on the market, I think are gonna do very little to stimulate uh, the construction of new housing. Okay, I give up. <laughs> okay. Hi, my name is Ronald Ausbrook, and I'd like to direct my uh, two-part question to uh, Mr. Rouse and to Mr. Spence. Uh, Mr. Rouse, uh, in your foundation, are, is there any research going on to deal with the the effects of destabilization in terms of creating support services for individuals who are who are homeless. Uh, I find that a lot of homeless shelters around the country uh, create, rather perpetuate the destabilization of the individual family. Uh, many home families are not able to stay in the shelter over a 24 hour period to find other places to live. Uh, even if you do find housing, you have to deal with the, the problem of of individuals being destabilized, what kind of support services are, are, are you all looking at that would assist that? The other part of the question I want to address with Mr. Smith deals with the issue of gentrification. Uh, many of the issues in, the, uh, in terms of homelessness has been the direct result of gentrification. Uh, to what extent are, are, are people battling uh, 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 that issue in relationship to dealing with the problems of homeless? Thank you. Well, there. 
there's a whole lot of different kinds of housing for the homeless. Uh, the pure shelter has got to be regarded as an absolutely temporary answer. I, uh, Patty and I went through uh, Mitch Snyder's shelter in Washington. Mitch Snyder's the very famous man in this business who, who uh, threatened to kill himself of starvation if uh, Reagan wouldn't do something to provide a building, which Reagan eventually did just before he died. Uh, he, he's a terrific man, and he has a huge shelter in Washington. And I went in expecting to see a lot of cots along the floor, and, and uh, we, were, we were stunned by it. it it's a wonderful shelter. Uh, it, uh, there are all kinds of different room sizes that the people can, can live in. He's got, uh, he's got a medical unit there. He's got a detoxification unit. There's, there's a, a lot of support services. Uh, he's built a very high morale in the, sh in the, in the shelter on volunteer help and uh, food serving and food pre preparation and cleaning, this kind of thing. There's no graffiti on the wall. He had contemplated they put on very special paint so they could take care of graffiti. There never is any graffiti. So by the time we got through, we were, we were enormously impressed with Mitch Snyder's shelter. But he summed the whole thing up in one phrase. He said, this is the best shelter in the world, and it's an abomination and should be destroyed. And that, that's it. Now, there are other shelters that are very different. We have four nuns in Cleveland who created a transitional shelter for, for uh, largely for battered women. Uh, they've been violated uh, all over the place, and they come in there in terrible condition, and they work with them. They work with them to, to get them uh, back in training for jobs, some of them going to college. Uh, they had enormous success in really transforming the lives of people who come there. There's a little uh, shelter in Washington in this Jubilee housing I mentioned called the Samaritan Inns that they've established. They take about nine men into a restored um, row house. They have to come in committing to no drugs, no alcohol, to take skill training and to go to work as a volunteer. And they send them out to a nursing home or somewhere to work. But they learn to work again. Uh, they got to be there on time and they and as they know, as they do learn to be on time, then they'll be turned over to the Jubilee jobs and placed in regular work. And the number of people who've gone through that, there's been a very high success ratio of people actually getting back into the, to the uh, uh, mainstream of life. Uh, in these New York projects, we've, we've allocated 1,000 units to 18 neighborhood groups in, uh, in New York, uh, all of which are now being completed. <laughs> Most of those are bringing in a, a, a professional social worker in each building, and they're linking what those people with whatever help they need so that uh, a lot of human service support is being given. Uh, and uh, there are too many just plain shelters that are, are better than on the street, but the danger is that they're going to be accepted as answers. Harry, do you want to speak to the gentrification side? Um. Again, I, I guess the, um, it, it does seem to me this question of, of gentrification uh, and homelessness and more broadly the question of gentrification and community development movement is, is a crucial one. If you ask yourself what's the difference between the urban renewal program and, and the community development movement, it seems to me that it's fundamentally that the premise of the urban renewal program was that in order to save the cities we had to move the poor out and bring stable, decent, orderly you know, uh, middle class people in, or otherwise these cities would just go to hell. And it's the premise of the community development movement that uh, poor people are stable, decent, orderly people um, who have had an, 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 an afflict, who are afflicted, who have been have inflicted upon them uh, levels of disorder um, uh, that are intolerable. And it is the uh, special challenge of the community development movement to test whether it's possible to restore order without displacement. Um, not, I say order, order is in a sense not the right word, but it's a, it covers so many things. To restore civility maybe is a better word, uh, without displacement. Um, that's a, still a, a questionable proposition. I'm reminded of the neighborhood in New York a few years ago um, in which the residents uh, insisted that the police not remove the junkies from the park 
because the junkies in the park were the one protection to that neighborhood from gentrification. Mm -hmm. um, that's a painful commentary on the choices that poor people face in these circumstances. Um, and I'm reminded as well that if we look in Boston at one of the exemplary examples of community development, the EBA development, uh, my Spanish is too poor to pronounce, to, to spell out the whole name, um, the EBA development, EBA started as a resident organization responding to the threat of urban renewal, saying urban renewal is displacement, we won't stand for it, uh, we're going to uh, take over the urban renewal area and revitalize it for the poor themselves. They did that absolutely superbly. The results are stunning. But the problem always is that there's a border. And after you've restored the EBA area, all of the private housing on the fringe is shortly thereafter gentrified. That question, it seems to me, is a terribly difficult one. It is, has to do with the question of the interplay between market mechanisms which respond to dollars um, and uh, alternatives to market mechanisms which we're trying to work out in the community development movement, and I think the movement continues to struggle with it and, and will. It clearly is making an enormously important statement and showing that more complex outcomes are possible than the lousy ones we've seen before, um, but it isn't yet clear what the full answer is. Bill, do you want to? Alan? One of the uh, do you things introduce that yourself, Alan? I'm Alan Altshuler professor in the Kennedy School. Uh, one of the things we've seen in recent years is that the numbers of uh, homeless people and people who have doubled up have been growing far faster than our capacity to develop new housing that's affordable. And uh, it seems hard to believe that we're going to uh, turn that situation around in the near future. So one of the central issues, clearly, is whether we can do anything with respect to market improvements that would reduce the magnitude of this problem, reduce the magnitude of the subsidies required. Uh, I've been struck recently by two extremes. One, New York City allocating half a billion dollars of local tax money in trying to create some housing for low-income people on the one hand. And on the other hand, one of the winners of our Innovations Awards competition, San Diego, which has created a system which has been quite successful in developing new single room occupancy uh, hotel units without any significant public subsidy by changing regulations, by creating market opportunities for private developers to come in and apparently even earn small profits, not substantial profits, but small profits and creating incentives for them to do so. Uh, we had a presentation at a conference that was jointly sponsored by the Joint Center for Housing Studies and the Taubman Center two months ago, three months ago now, uh, from Orange County, Florida, in which they've had a task force, as you probably know, which has been trying to look at the ways in which they might change their regulatory systems so as at least to enable developers to push further down in the middle, into the middle classes in the creation of housing than they've been able to do so far. And I'd be curious, based on your experience as a private developer, Mr. Rouse, uh, as to your sense of the extent to which we might dent the problem of housing affordability by improving our market mechanisms and our regulatory systems, as well as by subsidizing housing for the very poor in the society. We've never been, either in the Rouse Company or in Enterprise, a private developer of housing. But uh, we see a lot of, of all of the methods that can be devised for housing the poor, because we're seizing everyone we can find and trying to find a way to use it. Um, I, I think the, <laughs> the simple market mechanism is money and the rate of it. That uh, you can do, we've been able to do a lot in the state of Maryland because the state has a program where money is available as low as 4.5%. Uh, a lot is possible, more than is being done in Florida by the passage of a of a transfer tax that uh, uh, taxes all transfers of commercial real estate a half of one percent. Theoretically, go to housing for the poor, but that isn't exactly what happens. But that's twelve, fifteen million dollars a year. Uh, that could be a great device. I think there, there are more uh, uh, innovative tax mechanisms to be used than we're using. Uh, uh, Montgomery County, Maryland, one of the wealthiest counties in the state, taxed all conversions of apartments to condominiums, raised $20 million. Think of what an opportunity that's been in this country over the last 10 years. I mean, nobody 
nobody would be hurt by a tax on conversions from from apartments to condominiums except the speculator. But uh, gee whiz, that would have been back to free money if we'd seized it. This is the kind of thing I think we need to be more resourceful about. I don't think there are many mechanisms which we're always looking for to reduce the cost of housing. There, it's not mechanisms, it's, it's, it's resourceful application of every device available. That's, that's, uh, we have found that we could, we could build, first we found we could build four uh, houses on 50-foot uh, lots, three bedrooms, single family, one-story houses. We got the county to give us the land. We got the county to agree to, to uh, eliminate the connection charges for sewer and water. We got the state to lend us money at four and a half percent. We had a modular home builder with whom we worked to eliminate all the frills. No doors on the closets, curtains, no, no air conditioning. That could come later. Very nice little house. Sold for $29,500 uh, for $239 a month to a family making 9000 a year. Then we moved into the city. We got the city to give us the lots to fix up the streets, the curbs, the sidewalks, the alleys. Um, we got the same modular builder come in, two boxes, one on top of the other. Uh, made three bedroom brick row houses, state financing, uh, other financing helps. Uh, three bedroom brick row house sells for $256 a month to a family uh, making as little as $10,500 a year. Now this is where some variation on gentrification occurs, but the state raises the interest rate with the income. And uh, we generally have focused on housing for poverty poor, and we really have at times not approved projects if they were above poverty level income. But uh, in this case, and increasingly, I think, in similar cases, we would, the, the state raises the interest rate up to, to a, a different level for a family with an income of 17, 18,000, still a different level with family of income to 20, 22,000. And then these 171 houses, we have families going all the way from uh, income under 11,000 to income to 22,000, which might be called a minor form of gentrification. Uh, it really isn't, but it's a way of skewing income levels so that the neighborhood doesn't become as ghettoized as it might be if we have stuck to our, our poverty rule. A lot of good things. You've got to keep working at this thing in every little piece to find new ways, new answers. Uh, and there are a whole lot of them out there that we haven't even scratched yet. Let me go up to the balcony, this side first. Uh, my name is Hetty Potius, and I'm a Harvard retiree. Uh, most of the visions uh, that are spoken about are about young people and families. What about seniors? Uh, as single women are retiring, women who've been working uh, since the 40s and 50s, who've been paying state taxes and federal taxes, are now beginning to retire. Their income does not allow them to pay the market going rate um, of housing uh, in most communities. Um, the senior housing that exists is mostly occupied by women or, or partic mostly women, uh, but seniors in their 70s and 80s, and by newcomers to the country. What uh, do you see for uh, seniors uh, in the future, where are they supposed to go and live? Well, a lot of this housing that's being built by community development groups is for um, single or married older people as well as young people. It's not age focused at all. Um, also, there's another peculiar thing that's happened in our country. When we started Columbia, we were committed to 10% of the housing being subsidized housing. And uh, we started out that way. We had uh, two bedroom houses running for $127 a month with all utilities. But then in 72, Nixon pulled the credit subsidies from under that kind of housing and, uh, and it, it couldn't continue. But 202, which is the FHA section for housing, uh, the elderly has continued. And uh, we have an amazing lot of housing that's uh, uh, available only to senior citizens. Um, my, my hunch would be that by and large, the older people have a greater housing opportunity, older 
low-income people have a greater housing opportunity in the country than any other single age bracket. I don't know what For that, uh, the number of elderly as compared to families and, and single uh, or young families. Yeah, this is a very, <coughs> a very uh, unproven, un unworked over scientific hunch, but I, I feel that that's true. The side. Uh, I'm Andrew Richmond. Uh, I'm an undergrad here. And my question is has to do with the fact that we basically rely on the market to allocate housing. And most of the ideas that we've come up with or that have been discussed here tonight, with the exception of public housing, have had to do with helping the market to do its job allocating housing. My question is that we also have public housing, which kind of acknowledges that there are some limits, there are some problems that the market cannot deal with. My question is, I'd like you to address that problem. Are there problems that the market cannot deal with? And um, what are they? And how can we address those problems? Oh, absolutely. There are problems the market can't deal with. It's uh, um, what we're doing by one of these devices after another. Someone mentioned, I think, the New York City putting 500 million. New York City's putting five billion dollars in. New York City is taking these terrible old buildings, making them available to us and others. We turn them over to a neighborhood group. They'll make a $30,000 mortgage at zero percent interest. Um, and um, then we bring in a tax credit, which takes another thirty-five, forty thousand dollars $40,000 off the top. So the monthly payment gets down very low. But you can't get much lower than $250 a month in New York. It takes that to cover utilities. So then there has to be some other cash subsidy. You're only at, you're, you're, uh, uh, you're only at, uh, um, well, what are you, 250 to, I guess, at eight or 9,000 a year. Um, and uh, yes, there, there are other devices necessary, and there are other public housing devices that are being used today that, that don't have a lot of the, of the objections of the old existing public housing. There's scattered house public housing, in which public housing authority gets the money to build scattered housing in, in, a, in a city. Uh, it's pretty good, what I've seen. Uh, it's a pretty good answer. It's home ownership, it's, uh, uh, and it's, uh, in most cases, well, not new or rehabilitated housing. I think we'll make this the last question. Um, yeah, I, my question is addressed to uh, Dr. Spence. Um, what, what are you, I'm, uh, well, anyway. You look like a duck. <laughs> and, and also to, also to uh, uh, well, you other guys too. Um, <laughs> what, what, what do you mean by like political activity? Like when you said, when you said that, um, I'm an undergrad by the way, um, and, <laughs> well, I hope you're not going to try to get into the Kennedy School. <laughs> uh, so, what did what did you what did you intend by when you said that community development organizations have to focus on developing sort of uh, political activity in, in in neighborhoods? Well, I I just think that that a community development movement that seeks to respond to the problems of of impoverished communities needs to recognize that a very uh, a, a sort of massive element of, of that problem of impoverishment uh, is often, for example, the withdrawal of, of, of public services from those neighborhoods and communities. And uh, one can't talk about meaningful restoration of those neighborhoods without talking about finding some way to either uh, persuade or force the body politic to restore decent public services to that neighborhood. Um, the political capacity of local uh, resident organizations to become uh, what we call, when they are middle and upper class communities, effective civic organizations, um, it seems to me is something that's an immensely important. Um, I would like to see, I mean, I, I would hope that the community development movement increasingly puts resources into the development of effective civil, civic capacity in low income neighborhoods. Um, in order that the, some of the power issues that lie behind this might be redressed through political uh, uh, and advocacy action by the poor. Is that an answer to your question? Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> and David, either of you want to speak to that? Jim? 
Well, let me, on behalf of all of us, thank all our panelists tonight. I think is what is so inspiring about Jim Rouse's talk and about the entire discussion today is the dual focus of the discussion, i.e., the focus on the problem and the focus on calling our attention to conditions which need to be ameliorated, but also a focus on what we all can, in fact, do through a whole variety of mechanisms, public and private, developer and not, uh, that all of us can participate in. So let me thank all of our panelists uh, for being with us this evening, and thank you all for coming.